and give it up for the Gilmore guys. Howdy, guys. Bass comedy. It works. Am I on? One, two, one, two. Welcome. Oh, welcome. Felicitation. No? Oh. Oh, 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 oh. Good day. Good day. And joyous occasion. You, to you all. cool. <laughs> it is an honor to you and to us to join us today for. Episode, for show. For show. For I jump, you jump, Jack. I am for today, K. And for today, I am known as D. Big D. And us two are the, are, uh, B, is? Is Gilly, Gilly Guys. guys. We're not doing this the entire episode. No. Fuck that. No, 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 no. That That's was, awful. Oh my god. That is the worst. Oh my gosh. Oh boy. No, people were tweeting at us to do the whole show. No ease. That would be awful to listen to Are for you everyone involved. You would hate us. You would unsubscribe. We wouldn't say Lorelai. We wouldn't say Emily. It would not work. Guys, I, I can't see anyone. Who here has dressed up for the Life and Death Brigade? Oh, you all look beautiful. Woo! Thank you. Oh my goodness, Thank we got you for ball the gowns in the, of the front. Event. We got some out of straight out of Africa. That's the movie I want to see. Oh, I just can't wait to uh, get out of Africa. Is anyone? Is, are there any other gentlemen wearing tuxes? Woo! There's a lady Woo! in a tux. Woo! We'll count it. We'll count it. Okay, okay. Oh uh, well, we could do this all night, and we won't because that'd be terrible. But I think we should. Should we? Introduce our guests? Indubitably. Let's introduce our guests. <laughs> Hit that music. Come on. La la. Special guest. Well, guys, he is the king of podcasting. He puts the fashion in the F, and he is part of the Gilmore Guys origin story. We'll talk to him about it. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Paul, Paul F. F. Tompkins. La la. Hello. Special guest. Hell yeah. Woo! A Tom Kings. That's right. That's right. Beautiful. We're finally all together. We're finally reunited. Back together again. One and last it feels ride. So good. Yeah. Shall we have a seat? Why don't we, fellows? Let, let's do it. Let's do it. Paul, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you for having me, Demi. Thank you for having me. Of course. These gentlemen look very handsome. Thank you. For they, the listener at home. They, they emailed me and said, we want to wear tuxedos for the show. Where should we go? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Google is, was down, okay? Is that like weirdly stereotypical and offensive to you that people would assume <laughs> that? Or? It's not offensive. Okay, it let's go. It is something people do ask me a lot. Think, I, get, I get requests like that a lot. Sure. Yes. Because you're kind of the guy for that. That's right. One. And I'm constantly renting tuxedos. <laughs> and for the listener at home, Paul is dressed to the nines, straight out of Africa style, like the Life and Death Brigade. He is ready for the <laughs> safari. That's right. What do straight we call this hat? Style. What, do, what do we call this? This is a pith helmet. Oh, how pithy of you. So, I pithy the fool that doesn't look good in the pith helmet. I pithy the fool. That's the okay. hashtag for tonight's show. This was a double setup. <laughs> <laughs> you both had your pith jokes. Welcome to the Comedy Central Roast of Paul of This is not Revenge of the Pith, I promise. Now, Paul. Yes, Paul, yes. you are part of this Gilmore Guys story in a way you may not know. Because That's you, right. you were in the room the first time we were in the room together. And believe it or not... What room was this? Well, maybe not the first time ever, but the first time we knew. It was, uh, it was one of the UC Berkeley rooms. Right. UC Berkeley Franklin. Yeah. <laughs> UCB Franklin. This was 2013. And believe it or not, you've been a guest on our show several times. What? Without you knowing it. I'm going to throw up a little slide on the screen. Oh, sure. From a picture I took of that night. Now, this is Doug Loves Movies. 
Sure. This is uh, Adam Pally. Adam Pally, Gillian, Gillian Jacobs, Jacobs, me, and Mr. Paul F. Tompkins. Well, actually, I believe it's Werner Herzog. Oh, that's, oh, that's true. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's, that's right. true because. Why did I get the little water? <laughs> <laughs> I assume that was a choice. <laughs> well, Werner is a conservationist, so. <laughs> That's true. But of course, Gillian Jacobs, Gilly, one of the OG Gillies, Gilly. picked Demi's license for that night as one of the name tags. My credit card. And I was so lazy, I didn't make a name tag. I was like, please, get my credit card. That's true. And, and she said, oh, I know Demi, or as he's known on the internet, as Electro Lemon, Lemon. Yes. on Vine. And I let out a little, a single woo. A John and, and you commented a, 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 a pretty big Electro Lemon crowd in the house tonight. <laughs> yes. And um, since then, you have been one of our go-to soundboards. Electro Lemon. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul, thank you for joining us again it's, on it's, Gilmore Guys. It's always my pleasure to be back. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Pleasure per usual. Also, one I more. I can freshen up that sound clip if you'd like. If you want to, if you want a better quality sound. That oh, would please. be fantastic. We could do it right now. With your silence, no woos, no woos. It's a pretty big electro lemon crowd here tonight. Beautiful. Oh. Hopefully, that is usable audio. That is usable. I believe so, sir. Now, one other thing before we get into the episode discussion at hand, I wanted to commemorate is this week is very special for us because also part of the origin story, if you'll turn your attention to the screen, this isn't the exact date, but about a year ago. Look at the screen, those of you at home. Is when, <laughs> is when I first tweeted, want to start a podcast. Not I want to, just want to. I went direct for it. Start a podcast where we go through every episode of Gilmore Girls called Gilmore Guys. Who wants to co-host slash be a guest? And this is the tweet that led to this very podcast that you see before your eyes. Wow. Here's the thing. I was saying yes to being a guest. Uh, oh, no. Right. I'm gonna, I'm, I have to keep doing this? Yeah, well, you want, you're mm -hmm. like the guest co-host throughout. Oh, okay. <laughs> This is like when someone gets your name wrong and then it's past the point where you can correct them yeah. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that happens constantly. It's like when people call you Jimmy at the venues. That we I, just I go, feel like okay. I'm in the way. <laughs> You're having to look around me. No, to talk of course to not. Demi. Anyway, so let's get into the episode discussion. Uh, this is episode 507. You jump, I jump, Jack. It's a big you jump, I jump, Jack fan. Oh, that's true. That's a new soundboard. <laughs> big you jump, I jump, Jack crowd. And this is written by Mr. Daniel Palladino, a fave of some. And, <laughs> and the Netflix synopsis for this episode is Logan takes Rory to an elaborate event staged by his secret society. After discovering she's dating Luke, Lorelai's parents spend time with him. It's a fair synopsis. Sure. Yeah. Very straightforward. I mean, yeah, I get it. Doesn't spoil anything, sets it up entirely. We're mm -hmm. good. Yeah, it's actually, it's sound. The foundation is sound for this synopsis. <laughs> so let's get in the time machine. Do we have time machine sound effects? <laughs> Darth Vader is in the time machine tonight. <laughs> I'm actually running the booth. I just want to let you know. <laughs> right? And let's watch how the WB promoted this show. And I have to say, the tone is out of control. <laughs> it is a misrepresentation. <laughs> you look like you need a little adventure. Adventure, adventure, adventure. What? On the WB Tuesday, a curious attraction. Do I take enough chances? Where is this coming from? Lures Rory to his secret world. You know? Isn't this the point of being young? Now she'll take a risk. When you climb up there with me, it's one less minute you haven't lived. A risk she never imagined. But your choice is... Ah! <laughs> Tuesday at 7. Wow. Wow. This seems like a murder mystery. It yeah. It's straight up, this is how Rory ended up killing herself. This, that, that's what, that is the tone. 
This reminds me of all of the ads for the OC when they did the school shooting episode when, like, it got to... Wait, was it? No, the Oliver shooting episode, because someone will correct me on it. Uh, when they do this thing where it's like, and then something happens. You just hear a gunshot, and you see someone <laughs> falling, and you're like, I guess someone got shot, but <laughs> no one got shot, and no one died jumping off of a... A, a, like a pile of wooden... I don't know what that scaffolding... We'll get into that. <laughs> scaffolding. We'll get into it. Real-time corrections is the best thing about live shows. <laughs> but also, what a... What a gruesome idea that it's like, hey, you got to watch this episode where one of your favorite people dies. <laughs> Check it out. Ma, this person you've invested five years of your life in... <laughs> She jumps off some scaffolding. If you think about it, that would be one of the greatest con games ever. To like go through this like pretty pleasant series for four and a half years, mm -hmm. and then straight up Rory dies. Especially because it's the seventh episode, so they've still got like 11 or so to go, yeah. which is like, I guess we're mourning Rory for half a season. That's some Game of Thrones shit, oh man. Yeah. Well, let's get into it again with a little segment we call Pop Goes the Cold. Thank where you. we take every pop culture reference in the episode and put them together in a supercut and just kind of take it in and say, wow. 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 Ah. Oh, wow. Do we literally do that? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> so this is episode 507, You Jump, I Jump. Jack, pop goes the culture. In onion. You jump, I jump, Jack. We just had a very all the president's yeah. men moment. Learn golf the Arnold Palmer way. David Byrne is a freak. Charles Grawl used to get aspirin like candy. I give you more info, but it's all a little Dolly-esque. I see dead people. George Plimpton never participated. What? He's best stuff. Put him in the thick of it. Fighting Sugar Ray Robinson, quarterbacking for the Lions, skating for the Bruins. He whacked wow. Kent Kalita in the head with a club. Bill Buford lived with soccer hooligans in Amongst the Thugs. Does Pavarotti wow. want another donut? Ernie Pyle was so deep in the action in World War II, he was killed by a Japanese sniper. Once he hits his REM state, Motorhead wouldn't wake him. Richard Hollett was four months in a Nazi prison working for the UP. Hunter Thompson lived with the Hells Angels. Got in the muck, didn't just orbit wow. around it, and it drove his writing. He put you in those bikers' parties, he put you in those bikers' heads. More twist than O. Henry. Name so dropper. I have to read the Iliad and the Odyssey. I have to de-stress him after his unhappy Gilmore outing. Rhett is my gentleman friend, yes. Oh, stop making sense. May I quote Max Ernst? Sure. Oh, they got her. Wow. Wow. Uh, By the way. Uh, not quite uh, a wow, but... Uh, uh, uh. I, no, I thought, that, I thought oh. that's what we were supposed to oh, do. Oh, and we wow. Did it, we oh. just did it during. No, both oh, things are I true. See. I don't understand the Max Ernst reference. And I, I looked in the internet and I was just like, I don't... Well, can what? I explain it to you real quick? Please. So my favorite reference in the Supercut... What if you didn't? I was about to no, not. No, please. I please. was about to not. <laughs> Max Ernst, my big takeaway from this, because most of, like, probably half of the Supercut is Logan talking about journalists. And my big takeaway from this episode, dare I say, Rory is a garbage journalist. <laughs> yeah, she's <laughs> awful. She is not good. She's a terrible journalist. She is bad. We saw this in the last episode when she investigated the high, the high stakes world of illegal downloading of music. We also saw it when she was like, you're my subject, so here's what I'm going to do to get the scoop. I'm going to follow you everywhere, so pay attention. <laughs> and she's like sulking in the woods at one point. Gosh, she is not good at her job. Also, the conditions under which the story must be written no physical descriptions of the people there. No physical descriptions of the location. No, like, I don't know what word she has left to use. Nothing. She's going to quote <laughs> or that and we just have left to the use. entire thing. Well, what, yeah, what would be the story if you, can't, if you can't say, you can't describe the people and you can't describe the location? So can you describe the things that went on there? You can say there was an umbrella, there was a jump, it was death-defying. Was it death-defying? No. No. Okay, you got, let, let's, do, let's do a poll. Clap your hands so, if yeah. you found the big Life and Death Brigade event and the climax to be legitimately exciting. <laughs> Three, four, five, six. Uh, to those same people, let me ask you a question. Are you scared right now? <laughs> <laughs> Demi, get down! I jumped there. off the stage for those of you at home. Wow. But legitimately exciting in terms of uh, if, uh, if I were there, would I find that exciting? Or are you saying legitimately exciting to just watch 
these actors enact this? I think either way. Oh, that's a good point. No, because I think if you were there, then there would be some intrigue to it, especially if you're sure. doing it in a dress and there's a harness. But so, to watch it, it was not. It was not exciting. I, I do want to get into the specifics of this jump because I have a six point. Uh, complaint with that entire sequence. Well, shall we watch the jump? Well, uh, before that, I genuinely want an answer to what is the Max Ernst quote about. I, I legitimately... I do, does anybody get it? Don't answer him. Come on. He needs to learn on his own. If you answer him, he'll never learn. What was the Max Ernst quote? Uh, they go, can I quote Max Ernst? She says, sure. They turn and walk away. I don't... I don't, I don't think it matters. I don't think that's a reference to Max Ernst. I think it could have been anyone. Can I quote Paul Lynn? They could have turned That's away. That's so weird. It was just time That's for a reference. That's weird, yeah. right? It was just time. Look, we've gone, we've <laughs> we've gone, gone. One, one and a half minutes without a reference. Let's cram one in there. That's insane. Can I also say that uh, the Pavarotti joke, that was a real cheap shot, right? Yeah, does Pavarotti, Pavarotti want Pavarotti another want donut? Another donut? Oh, and he's yeah. dead, guys. D-E-A-D. Yeah. Rest in peace. Buy donut. In uh, a roundabout way. Buy by donut. <laughs> By donut. <laughs> <laughs> now, just before we get out of pop culture, sure. uh, I'm going to feel stupid for asking this. Demi, we you... never get out of the pop culture on this show. That's true. Uh, you Jump, I Jump Jack is a reference to what? Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, what? Tell yeah. me. At well, the count ridiculous. Three, yell it at this me. Guy. One, ridiculous. two, three. He know. What is oh. That? What was it? It's Titanic. It was Titanic. A movie I haven't the seen in about movie? 10 years. And only remember for a sequence in which someone hits their head on a propeller and spins wildly well, out of control. Well, my question about that is if that was even a direct quote from Titanic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah Kevin, you idiot. You're talking to the wrong people, Kevin. <laughs> you big old dum-dum. <laughs> but I will, I will say, though, what, what changes it is, of course, this guy's name is not Jack, so it takes on a different <laughs> meaning. That's true. It takes on a totally different meaning because when, when the person in Titanic, when Rose is addressing Jack... It's like it's it's this expression of love, it's personal, as opposed to oh, I, I'll do whatever you do, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> it you becomes jump, a totally. I, jump, Logan, I didn't catch it work. as a reference at all. I, so your the sentiment you took away from it is if you're jumping off a bridge, I'm jumping off a bridge. That's exactly what yeah. I got from it. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. Yes, but I also I guess didn't get the most popular reference of all time. Rather than this WB drama series uh, putting itself in the pantheon of the greatest love stories like Jack and Rose and Titanic, because it's essentially. That's what the line does, right? That reference makes it that kind of... Do you think that this is the greatest love story ever? No, no, no I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm saying that might have been the attempt or the desire. I so hope like, this was not the attempt because it's a terrible attempt. But I maybe do... That's, maybe that is, explains the delivery of the line. Yeah. Is that they're pulling back from a little bit. You like, jump hey, jump. I don't think people are going to buy that we're conflating the Titanic love story with right. this love story. <laughs> Just mumble it away. Don't move that jaw, Roy. So, in general, <laughs> let's talk. Okay, the, I, I do want to say this. The German episode title Ooh. is Sprungs ins Ungsweiss, meaning leap in the dark. And the French episode title is Pas de Repeat pour les brav Bravas, Braves, Braves, which means no rest for the brave men. I heard some people groaning during my French pronunciation. <laughs> You, uh, your French sounds like you're trying to impress a waiter at a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> and I'm never not. Right, yeah. You're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish it was like Thou Sprouten, Zone Sprouten, Jack, or something. I, I want to... <laughs> Jacques, it would be Jacques. Right. I do want to deconstruct no rest for the brave men. Are these men brave? No. Well, the men who jump <laughs> off of the paintball launcher are brave. Um, that was fun. I thought that was legitimately cool. I thought it was funny. I thought that's a more dangerous stunt. <laughs> well, let's back it up a, yeah. uh, a little bit. So this was being set up in episode 506 when Rory is going down that dead end of the downloading story. And this story literally falls into her lap when a, a, a woman in a gorilla mask goes into the bathroom and she investigates it. By the way, you, you did suggest to me uh, here's the episode we're doing. Uh, I, you know, you could watch the previous episode. It sets it up. I did not need to watch that previous episode. <laughs> I might have more accurately needed to say you should watch the previously on. Yeah, don't fast that, forward. That, the previous the first on, twenty seconds. Previously on set everything up very nicely. That is true because in the last episode. Yeah, they don't follow up on Christopher with Sherry leaving him. They don't follow up on Suki being pregnant. They don't follow up on Norman Mailer. 
He's having his wife. Zero yeah. Norman Mailer follow <laughs> The greatest mystery of our well, time. he died the very next day, so they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> the very next day? They were like, oh, this is a bad time to air it. Mm. Is that true? No, 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 no. no, no. no. <laughs> he died three, three years after that episode was aired. Peacefully in his bed. Yes, sorry, uh, I guess. <laughs> he'd accomplished everything a novelist could accomplish. Appearing on Gilmore Girls. That's but, right. So the Life and Death Brigade. Oh, I'm so sorry. I apologize to we you. We weren't saying oh. anything of importance. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> The Life and Death Brigade is kind of set up like a skull and crossbones type society, uh, i.e. the famous, I think it was a Yale society. Yeah. Real-time yes. corrections, anyone? It's yes? Yale. No. Okay, uh, George Yale. Bush was in it. <laughs> skull and bones. Skull and bones. Did, did I say, say cross and bones? You said skull and crossbones. Oh. Which is like a Thank Marvel you. character. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, who's a Marvel character? Crossbones. <laughs> Yo, what's up? I'm crossbones. <laughs> so it sets it up. It's this mysterious, intriguing thing to the point where in the last episode, we did see a picture in the paper of men in suits jumping off a thing wearing gorilla masks. Right. So they are essentially, I guess in this episode, repeating the same stunt or paying homage to it in some way. Yes. Let's go to the, because you wanted me to clip this scene out. When they first arrived to the campsite. Okay. You have something to point out with this? I, yeah, yes. <laughs> should, we, should we watch it and then talk about it? Sure. Okay. It's a very small thing, but it's a very weird thing. It's okay. two things, actually. Small thing, but weird thing. My stuff. These mountain areas revivified me. <laughs> Make sure he doesn't run off the cliff. Stephanie, it's your turn. Dan, you slow down. I changed my mind. It's three things now. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's get point in. Point number one. What was his like weird mountain man like? I've revivified. Ha, ha, ha. Like he runs off into the woods. I assumed it was an Australian thing, and if I didn't understand it, then I just didn't understand that I, culture. I, I, I wonder if they're trying to just be like he's very Australian. Between that and the like, it's too bright. It's four o'clock. Usually down under, it's dark this time. Or like I don't know what that was about. <laughs> uh, the second thing is in the subtitles for this episode. It says Danny, slow down. Who's Danny? Oh, that's true. No, no, no. That's his real name. That is his what? real name. Yeah, that, that's the only time they say Danny, I think, in the series. Wait, then how do we know it's his real name and not just a... Whose who's real name? Uh, Finn. Finn, the guy who Mountain Man yells yeah. and runs off. What's his name? His name is Finn, as we've been Finn. told, but he is referred to as Danny for a split second. This is like Craig versus Jackson all over again in 504. <laughs> they've had like two episodes with him. They can't just be like, mm, what's his name? Uh, I forgot. It might be Finn. It might uh, be... The third thing, which is the most important thing, the whole reason I want to clip this out, she uh, runs to the lanterns. So the lantern is the distance from me to Kevin right now. She okay. goes, Finn, wait. <laughs> <laughs> and she kicks her legs wildly up behind her as if she's about to break into a sprint and then goes maybe four feet. <laughs> and I, it distracted me so much that I had to rewind to figure out what the first line that Rory says when they arrive is. I, I know someone who uh, worked on the original TV show, The Equalizer. Mm. The Equalizer was a TV... No. <laughs> Proto Denzel. A big uh, Equalizer. The Equalizer was a TV show back in the 80s, I want to say, and it starred an old man as The Equalizer. He was this guy that people would hire to fix problems in their lives. He was just like this benevolent fixer. And so The Equalizer, he would always get the bad guys, but... Because he was an old man, if he was chasing someone, the actor being chased had to do a very specific run <laughs> that they called the equalizer run on the set. And it oh, was, man. you had to do, <laughs> you had to make it look like an incredible amount of effort that you were trying to get away, but you couldn't really go that far. So you had to, would you? Well, hold this sure, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> You could just barely move an inch at a time, but you had to make it look like you were running your ass off. Truly the greatest challenge for actors. Yeah, One it is. <laughs> it's as true today as it was in Shakespeare's time. <laughs> <laughs> that the equalizer run is the biggest challenge. That's right. Absolutely. So for the Life and Death Brigade, there's been such this buildup, and then we get there, they're doing... Uh, Straight out of Africa. I can't stop saying it. I'm not trying to. Which is weird because straight isn't in the title. Right. It's just out of Africa. Right. <laughs> They're doing a out of Africa thing. <laughs> or straight out of Africa. I'm trying not to. I don't. I don't know why this is hard. I'm so sorry. Hey, yo, Meryl. They're we gotta tell these busters something. <laughs> 
<laughs> They're doing an out of Africa theme, or as some people pointed out, a great Gatsby theme. Sure. Dressed much like Mr. Tompkins is tonight. Kevin, do you think that by the time this episode drops, someone will be taking that straight out of Compton meme and doing straight out of Africa memes with... If someone else doesn't, I will. There's no way it has not been done before. That's true. But with this particular episode, maybe that's new. If someone does it on Twitter by midnight tonight, then you will give you $1,000 from the Gilmore Guys. I'll bank. do it. Oh, from Kevin. I, I might do that then. This show's not going to get out before midnight. I'm That's just going to go get my laptop right now and do it on stage. Um, do we find this interesting? Is this a cool thing that all these rich, these entitled kids have all the money in the world and this is what they choose to do with it? I hate them. Same. <laughs> I, hate I them. also hate them. Yeah. I found them, I found them all deeply unpleasant. Uniformly. Yeah, to a man. Even <laughs> Let's also be clear. They call it the Life and Death Brigade so many times that we forget. It's a fraternity. It's yeah. a glorified fraternity that met in the woods. It's just like a rich people's club. It's and Boy Scout Bohemian Grove. Yeah. I, it's not interesting. <laughs> so if you were in a similar position and you had all the money in the world and you could do whatever you wanted for your secret society, what would you have done instead? Underground stonemasons cult. Okay. Underground stonemasons cult? Yeah. People ask me all the time and I say Ooh. the same thing. I gotta change mine now. Um, <laughs> Classic. I would do the exact same thing, but with laser tag. Hell yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah. I would have made it better for We'd sure. We do all that twee bullshit during the day. <laughs> and then once it was dark. <laughs> Is that the subtitle for this episode? Best. Twee bullshit? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Oh, man. And I, if I was in a position, I would start a little podcast community where we all make podcasts in our little <laughs> If you tapes. had all the money in the world. Yeah. Okay. Because it's truly the greatest art form. Also, <laughs> also, is the idea that they are doing this on a regular basis or is this like a once a year thing? They get together and they have the big event. I can't remember if it was an ongoing thing that the Life and Death Brigade I don't recall. does. It seems like a one... But they did it like a week ago also because the woman ran... Because Gorilla Girl was running through the bathroom. I guess it's on occasion. Like, it's often enough that if they do jump from that thing every time, people shouldn't be surprised still. Uh, I'm, I bet they go camping all the time. No, because she was in a dress. They weren't in a dress. What? I don't know. I got the impression that they had, from what Rory said, a line that Rory had, that they have a big showpiece event thing that they do. Right. And so she was trying to guess what it was. And then it turns out it was that. Um, <laughs> but what was the th what was her guess again? It was oh when people were were doing the human skeet shooting or yeah. something. Oh, is this the big event? Oh, I hate it when I just think about it. <laughs> <laughs> you, so mad. You didn't enjoy human skeet shooting? No. Oh. I thought it was shot in a very funny way with them. Like, well, at first when they show how it fully happens, I was just like, okay, so there's no more, and they shot like five more people. And then when they do the close-ups, they just cut to people like being thrown out wildly <laughs> and getting shot. It was like uh, when Uncle Phil throws jazz out of the house in Fresh Prince. The reference we were all thinking. There was an impressive wonder in there where there was one shot that lasted for like a, what felt like a minute and a half or two minutes where it shows Finn running off to be human skeet. Danny? Da uh, when it show <laughs> Thank you. When <laughs> it shows Danny running off to be the human skeet to be thrown and then he has to change off his clothes and do a quick thing. And it was all in one take. And I, I was just thinking how much take. of a, like, a difficult costume change because they probably didn't actually shoot him Although, off camera. Did they not? Was that not when they cut to people flying through the air? No, there was there was two components oh, okay. to that scene. I, I don't. And we'll even watch them all now. I don't even notice the one takes on the show anymore. It's just kind of part of the language of it. So I'm not. I'm simultaneously not impressed and also impressed that they can do it and make it so seamless every time. So let's talk about, in my opinion, the star of this episode, Logan Huntsberger. <laughs> <laughs> now our first impression of him, five hundred three. He's a big old jerk that likes to ski going forward like yep. this. That's his natural <laughs> posture and disposition. Igor. 506, he's wearing a god-awful brown ensemble turtleneck. Yeah, the Robert Goulet tactical turtleneck. Yeah. And, yeah, it's not good. Not into it. 507, this is one of Logan's bigger episodes, and we'll play a clip of him convincing Rory through the magic of knowing what journalism is. All right, all right. So, you know, those guys participated. I got it, but I... Jumpers to their places, please. You're scared. 
Well, yeah. And that stops the grades? It's stopping this grade. Come on, you look like you need a little adventure. What does that mean? You're just a little sheltered. Why? Because I haven't spent time in a Nazi prison, been stomped on by hooligans and beat up by Hell's Angels, and Plimpton got banged up pretty good, too. It'll be fun. It'll be a thrill. Something stupid, something bad for you. Just something different. Isn't this the point of being young? It's your choice, Ace. People can live a hundred years without really living for a minute. You climb up here with me, it's one less minute you haven't lived. Let's go. I just read Fight Club. Let's go. <laughs> That's better than Fight Why Club. Why doesn't you no, it's say <laughs> it's like bungee jumping except there's zero danger? <laughs> <laughs> something stupid, something bad for you. <laughs> something completely safe. <laughs> Although, okay, so... If this was a real stunt, it would be safe. But the way that they set it up, uh, I, I keep wanting to talk about the jump, and I'm going to stop myself from doing everything about it. The harness... We can talk about the jump. Okay. The harness is a ribbon with two pieces of Velcro around it, just going around the waist. Uh, the harness for Logan is a hook in the back of his pants. So this would have killed them. Do you want to look at the clip? Let's just please, look at the let's clip. Please watch let's this watch clip. Let's watch the clip. This is the actual jump. I really should have confirmed that those potatoes were okay. And they're fine. Oh, thank God. <laughs> you did good, Ace. Look at that. Once in a lifetime experience. Only if you want it to be. They're about to... What are, what are they... Why are they... He's like, ah, ah, don't kiss, I got champagne. <laughs> Why can't they yeah, the, stand? What is, what's happening? The guy with the champagne was the best. If you look at that guy, he's trying to hand it to Logan. Yeah. And he's kind of following like, hey, stop, him the whole you, time. <laughs> she lost her sense of gravity in the two <laughs> seconds she was in the stop air. Stop having emotional catharsis and drink this. So the fall starts <laughs> from them. So they jump off, and it seems like they are actually gaining speed until they slow down in the next shot. Yeah, then they really slow down. Yes, and then in the very last shot, they pick up speed real quick again. Yeah. Rory That's leans the, forward as if Christ. she's falling back to Earth for the first time. It's insane. And if that had happened, again, they would have died. Um, I don't know which rules to follow of like, the, the way it's set up is a terrible thing, but also if done correctly, this wouldn't have been a bad stunt. Uh, so I will go with both saying that it's the it's a very like s like boring stunt that you see at like a a big mall. You know those malls that have a like a big mall. You know those malls. Where you don't they know push mall you? stunts. I <laughs> Come on, Kevin. Come on. You know those malls. Where You're they being push willfully you? obtuse. <laughs> <laughs> they put you in like the baby swing thing with your legs going through it, and they bungee like cord you to the top of the thing, and you just jump on a trampoline yeah. for like ten minutes. It's that, except you don't have fun. What they it's <laughs> it's weird the what's weird to me about it is it almost seems like they're trying to reassure the audience in the middle of the stunt. Like when it starts, it looks like there's no harness at all, right? right. When they're at the top, like, oh my god, what are these idiots doing? <laughs> Umbrellas don't work like that. This isn't Mary Poppins. <laughs> then in the middle, they're going so slowly and you see the wires so clearly. And then at the end, when they do the big thing, it's like they're trying to get the excitement back. Yes. Like, but it was like just in the middle of a split second, like, guys, it's going to be fine. Right. Don't worry. I mean, to me, that stunt has an arc. It tells a story. There's a beginning. There's a middle. There's and a meandering some... second act that kind of loses steam and yeah. then picks up at the end with a big climax. <laughs> That's one way to look at it is what I'm saying. But in general, it is... A little disappointing. It is, yeah. but I'm also. Does anyone sorry. think it's it's disappointing? Does anyone agree with that? Here's what else. How come not everybody got to do it? Like, they, there's a bunch of people. Are they? Who decided who got to do this amazing life changing? Have this amazing life changing experience, and who got to just watch <laughs> it happen? Whoever and get the, the champagne ready. Well, perhaps this was round one of like five. So everyone gets a turn. Everyone gets to go up there. At then some why point. not just wait and say, oh, they did it. All right, let's go. You know? You raise a good point. <laughs> there's holes here. I'm not saying there's not holes. Demi, there's it's not a perfect hole. show. When I asked you to do this a year ago, I didn't promise it'd be perfect. You did. But you DM me. You're like, don't worry. It's a perfect show. I might promise that. But then after that, I didn't promise it'd be perfect. I promised it'd be good. And I promised it'd be something we'd all remember for Should the rest I, of our lives. Should I get out of here? No, you're fine. I want you to see this. All right. <laughs> I promised it'd be a journey we all go on. Are Demi. you going to propose to me? What's happening? <laughs> Demi. 
you can live five lifetimes without, <laughs> without really living a lifetime if you don't live it with me doing a podcast. So what do you say? Ugh. You cast, I cast, Jack. Get to your seat. <laughs> By the way, that uh, quote is like a really bad yearbook quote. I don't think it means... It's a Facebook quote, yes. right? Like, it, it's... it's uh, you yeah. jump, I jump, Jack? What was that? <laughs> you jump, I jump, Jack? No, the... Uh, uh, no, <laughs> no, the, uh, no, 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 the... People can live 100 years without ever really truly living for a minute. Which... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what did you say in the previous episode in Omnia Paratus actually means? Because it means oh, ready for all things. It's YOLO. But it essentially means YOLO? <laughs> yeah. They fancied it up. It's YOLO. Which, you know, fine for them. It has no ease. It fits your weird rule. Oh, that... that <sighs> Let's play the oh, clip, Are we going to talk about baby. it? Play talk? that clip. Clip time. It drove me nuts. <laughs> Dubious logic if you ask this thoughtful guy. Hello, everybody. My God. Shocking. Silly girl. Not adjusting to this proud point of ours. Sad, this diminishing vision. Excuse me? Faux pas count is six, I say. Six, no doubt. I again concur. Point of fact, daft lady. To catch on would prompt our congratulations. It's a game? At which you totally fail. You want for instruction? Apparently. Said gap twixt D and F shall not slip from lips in any word this group allows. Said gap twixt D and F. You're not using the letter E? Says this thing our group did banish. Loud for all to drink in. Daft girl. So no one is supposed to say the letter E? My god, this woman hounds us with this thing I banish. Dumbfound. Um, I'll catch up with you guys later. Have fun, if that's what you're doing. Bloody horror, that woman. Ostracism should occur, I think. Ugh, fuck all of you. I agree. <laughs> They're the worst. The worst. Also, people but, made this out to be like the entire the entire group. Everyone does it. It's just the four guys. Everyone else is <laughs> tired of it and just kind of ignores that rule. So I think it's a game that four people play and no one else talks to them because they're just like, no, I'm not. I can't. My name has an E in it. I'm not doing this. That's the thing. Are we supposed to enjoy the whimsy of these guys or are we supposed to despise them, which I did? Well, yes. that's. I think that's kind of the brilliance of the show and brilliance of like this particular thread because this is... Rory being wooed by the other side of money and the other side of entitlement. We've seen it represented. We've seen wealth represented through Richard and Emily and high class and society and Biddy Charlson and all the high class names. But this is supposed to be like the more luring part, I think. I, th that's what I'm getting from the story. Like their creativity and their whimsy slash douchiness is supposed to be something that's like interesting and lures w Rory more into that world. Or but that's but does it or is it all... Logan, because she doesn't she doesn't seem particularly entranced by any of the people. And even with Logan, it's like he has to really give her a hard sell to get <laughs> her to do the jump. It just seems like she she doesn't seem that interested or intrigued by any of it. She's just kind of walking around and taking notes and but she doesn't seem to be having fun. It's not no. like it's not until she does the jump that you see any kind of moment of her seemingly loosening up or being into this world at all. It takes a lot. To make a stew? <laughs> oh, please don't. <laughs> am I, I mean, am I wrong? Or am I no, no, I, you're correct. I feel like, well, I'll have to think about that. I wish you would. <laughs> I will say... <laughs> On stage thinking is the best part please. of my <laughs> podcast. I don't know why she was allowed to be at this event. Like... I don't know. Because Logan, I feel like, is the unofficial leader of this group. Yes. They're like, oh, there are no leaders. It's Occupy Wall Street. But there's, <laughs> Logan's the leader. For rich people, finally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then why is it a secret? Like, do you know what I mean? Whether it does, it's barely a group. They, they just seem to have. How many people do you think are there? Like 30, 40? Yeah, maybe 30. Maybe 30 or 40? It seemed like even less to me. So why is it a secret in the sense of like... So they can drink in the woods with no one, no rangers going, yeah, hey, you they, they make it, they, they, there's so much secrecy that surrounds, and I guess that's part of the fun of it, but they're not doing anything, I don't know, I just hated them. I think it, it's only secret because Rory wouldn't be there if it wasn't. Would we have right. preferred something edgier, like they're skinning a goat in the woods, and Rory comes upon it's like, oh, yes, oh, I want full-on Santeria. What's that? I want a full-on animal sacrifice. I would not have minded some dark ceremony. <laughs> yeah, that's all I'm saying. Or maybe it was everything that happened up to that point, but then the big event was like a goat had the <laughs> umbrella jumped off the platform. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just one goat. People can live 100 years and never push a goat off a scaffolding. 
<laughs> they tape an umbrella to a goat and they shove it I off. I just really, I'm so desperate to incorporate a goat into Gilmore Girls. Gilmore, Gilmore Goats. Goats. Yeah. I'm just so confused. Also, they make, uh, they make her dress up for the morning event, but not for the night one. Can we talk about how Logan has an eye for dress sizes and that eye is literally... Like, this is where the show gets kind of supernatural, I feel like. Mm -hmm. Logan has a perfect eye. Is that a thing? I mean, surely it, it's happened. <laughs> like how people have perfect pitch? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you <laughs> can just look at anybody and tell you their dress size. <laughs> I mean, is that a thing? I don't know. Uh, two. Anyone? Uh, this is two. dangerous. Don't two. do this. Don't do this. <laughs> I can't see anyone, so if I point it to anyone, know that I didn't. Um, <laughs> I bet his eye for dress sizes is just like, probably a medium. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know what it could be more. But it fit her so well, I is my point. I would have loved to have seen the scene of him with full cat burger outfit, breaking into her apartment at night and just measuring her. <laughs> Nothing weird, just measurements. Right, yeah. yeah. Also, why were there spare gowns? There were spare <laughs> gowns? Well, she didn't, that wasn't her dress, right? I think Logan just brought it I for her. I feel like he bought it specifically for her. And yeah. then surprised her. Surprise. Yeah. It was amazing how it was perfectly unwrinkled in the box, though. Oh, yeah. Again, this is a supernatural so show. What's that? He put it in the box like four seconds before saying, hey, go look under your bed. <laughs> do we feel like this journey was worth it, the journey into the Life and Death Brigade, into Logan? Do you see the appeal of Logan at all at no. this point? Still. He's still a frat boy, and like, no offense to anyone who's in a fraternity who's no, listening. I mean, but well, some offense. How many... How many uh, <laughs> How many I, people in this audience were a part of a fraternity or are currently? All right, you're fine. <laughs> so it's really, it just, I don't feel like there's any intrigue to him that I'm just like, wow, this is the guy. Like, he's charming, but he's charming in a way that is like off put. Like, it's just, he's just a dick. And he's, he does this thing where like his whole charm is being like, I don't care about you, I'm quirky. And just I, walking around with his hand in his pocket. I think he's smarmy. Yeah. He is smarmy. Smarmy. That's and maybe a double-edged that... sword. I feel like a, a jest defender when I defend Logan. Like, because I, I hear myself Look, and I understand. You have more of a vision of him. Do I've you... seen him three times. Sure. But you, you like this guy and you think he's fun? He's charming? I think, well, here... I'm genuinely asking. Here... <laughs> <laughs> I feel a little bit on trial I here, did guys. Not, I, did not... <laughs> I, I think that... This is the most interesting and most dynamic love interest for Rory up to this point. And I think Matt Zuckery's charisma is the most outstanding up to this point. He has one of those voices. I was thinking about this while watching the episode. He has one of those like super interesting voices where he can put gravitas and urgency into anything. He's I think he's seriously a tremendous actor. He almost reminds me of Clark Gregg in that sense. You know what I mean? You know how Clark Gregg, Agent Coulson from the Marvel movies, he can make line readings be so interesting and pointed and, and communicate something very interesting that's not there just blank on the page. You know what I mean? Are you right. saying Are you uh, saying th him as an actor overall or in this? have you seen him in other things in addition to this show? I Well, I've seen a little bit of The Good Wife, but mostly in this show is my experience with Mr. Zucri. As an actor. <laughs> Mr. Zucreed. Um, <laughs> Keep it professional. I, it's a, I think it's a tough thing with shows like this or like an Aaron Sorkin show where the voice of the, of the writer, of the, the tone of the show is so strong. I'm so name? sorry. I was trying to do it real quietly. I, was so, I, was, I felt like I was really far away and then I scooted my chair up and then I was like, no, I'm too close. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Please continue. <laughs> Live shows are fun. Were you the, uh, uh, do you feel that you're close enough now? I'm good. All right. How do you feel about your distance from everything? I feel okay. I feel a little tethered. I feel like a piano player in a band. Right. You know what I mean? Sure. Because it's like, I can rock and roll, but I still got to go back to the keyboard. At least a piano player can stand up, but that drummer, he's just stuck behind them drums, man. That, that's a, the drummer's a bummer, I would say. Unless you're Don Henley. <laughs> And then it's like, hey, I'm going to sing lead from back here. <laughs> <laughs> um, Are we having an older, oldest reference contest <laughs> on the show? Because <laughs> we could. Um, 
Wait, what the fuck was I talking about? <laughs> oh, Logan Matsukri, the actor. When the when the voice of the of the show itself is so strong, and it's sort of the challenge for the actors is, how do I deliver this dialogue that is uh, somewhat regimented in its rhythm? It must be word perfect. And still, I have to give it some kind of performance. And and I think the problem is, it's if you watch the show, if you watch episode to episode, uh, as I did with West Wing, I could see the nuances of people's performances more easily uh, and, and more quickly as I watched the show. Whereas I have not seen this show in a long time. And so this is my first time watching an episode, which I'd never seen before, because I only seen the first couple seasons of this show. So to me, everyone sounds exactly alike. Like everyone's, the delivery of every line is the same and it's harder for me to see the, the subtleties in the performance. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So for that, for me with that guy, it was it was tough for me to take him in as a as a charming dude that was any different than anyone else. Like, because why isn't she in love with him over there? Sure, he sounds exactly the same. Oh, with Danny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, yeah, I had no idea Danny Strong was in the show. Oh yes. And then he had like his cool floppy hair and everything. <laughs> was that cool? Was that floppy hair cool? In the for Danny Strong, sure. <laughs> I've never seen Danny Strong with hair like that before. The, there's awe is coming. I don't from think it was audience. an insult. It was it was not meant as an insult at all. Danny Strong, you're the one who questioned the coolness no. of my hair. <laughs> I think the point of this is that we love Danny Strong, and nothing said here tonight can be used against us in a court of law. Danny Strong, much more compelling performance to than, me than Mr. Zucre. Yeah. <laughs> I d- then Mr. Zucre. Again, I'm not trying to say Mr. Mr. Strong Zucre. delivers a bravura performance <laughs> in the role of child hard-boiled reporter boss. <laughs> oh, man. So, so still, not, we're not in the Logan camp. We're not Team Logan. This didn't this do is, anything to convince you otherwise. This wasn't persuasive. It didn't convince me, but it did make me go, I guess this is the most interesting thing we've seen of him thus far, which isn't, a, like, again, it's one of three. Um, and I feel like, so the scene that I think was his best is when he's telling Rory the rules. That's the nicest I've seen him, but it also does start with him going, this food isn't for you, it's mine. <laughs> Which uh, feels like a thing that you would do jokingly to be charming, then just go, I'm kidding. Here you go, Ace. That's what I would have been like, okay, he likes her. He cares about her. Oh, we're talking about with the plate of food. Yeah, but something about him actually being like, no, I wasn't kidding. I'm going to eat this in front of you (laughs) bothered me. (laughs) And then for him to continue and tell the rules, I was like, all of the things that I feel like he's doing for her are behind the scenes and aren't really justified. Like him allowing her to even get there, him buying the dress, you know, him taking her aside and telling her the rules without uh, speaking with no ease. Like it's all these things that, it's really just like we're, we're set up to be like, he's rich. And that means he can, you know, he can give things to Rory sometimes. And I'm just like, I don't care about that. Like, that's really... His biggest dimension is that he's rich, and I don't think that makes him good. Like, I don't care for him so far. But again, he's fun to watch. He's interesting. He I, makes people jump off scaffolding, <laughs> which he make anyone. would never do. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say his biggest dimension as a character so far is that he is joyous, which, again, it's easy to do when you have all the money in the world, but... That he is a happy, per- he doesn't have the baggage, the demons, let's say a Jess, right. or at this point a Dean would as well. Dean has a short cameo on this episode as a voicemail where he suggests they meet up at an interstate diner, I believe, for a hot dog special where they can stir the nacho cheese or something. I don't know. I got but- three hours. That's enough to have sex four times. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that was what he said because in the previous episode, he does go like, it's like absence make the heart grow fonder. Sex does too. And you just get the sense that like Dean's really just like every time he goes to the checkout, it's like, going to see my girlfriend tonight. <laughs> Hope we have sex. Like, to, like <laughs> he's just obsessed with it. I want to talk about the other major threat in this episode, which is Luke interacting with Emily and Richard in such a way that feels, well, let's just play the clip. We'll we'll play the clip. We don't serve roadkill at my place. Well, good for you. I had a friend who ate at a diner once and the next day she dropped dead. Her family considered suing the place, but there's nothing to get from these people, a couple of stools and a toaster. But they were sure it was a matter of hygiene and they eventually drove them out of the state. I don't want to tell you what they found when they moved the stove. 
Would you like another beer, Luke? Beer? I, that was my favorite line reading of the episode. For sure. Would you like another beer, Luke? Just, I have a huge problem with this, though. Oh, me too. What is it? <laughs> Hold on to your seats, All right. both of you. Don't scoot them. I would say the big issue is that this does not seem consistent. And I think for, for the research for this show, I ended up, you know, like we always do, we always read a lot of articles and reviews. We go to the forums as they occurred, you know, 11 years ago. And the interesting thing about this episode is that this is the only episode with audio commentary on the Gilmore Girls DVDs. And Wait, it's, what? Why? Out of the entire series? Yeah. It's just this one, yeah. Is this her favorite episode, Are you, maybe? wait, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> is this a revelation? Because they had to explain a lot, I'm sure. Out of the seven seasons of this program. That's true. That are on DVD, this one episode is the only one that has an audio commentary? And here's the best part. It's Daniel Palladino and Amy Sherman Palladino, and she leaves halfway through. <laughs> She's straight up, and they don't mention it, but at the they end, don't mention but literally at the end, Daniel goes, I'm Daniel Palladino, and I'm Amy Palladino. Like, he does an impression of, like, That's it's great. so strange. But the quote, the quote that really struck out for me from this, you're still reeling I from can't, this. I can't understand it. <laughs> Why did they bother? Why did they bother doing the one? <laughs> I like to imagine they started recording this, and Amy was like, no, wait, I fucking hate this. And they were like, okay, we won't do the rest of it then. Like, she was like, we'll start with my favorite episode. Mm, this was a bad idea. I mean, they're no Matt Groening for sure. But here's what I imagine. I imagine that it, like, Warner Brothers, home videos, like, we need you to, like, create something. And literally, an audio commentary, if you think about it, is the bare minimum of what you can do. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, you can show up in your pajamas. You can do it at home. Yeah. You, you, they, we're basically doing an audio commentary right now. You can pretend minimum. to be watching the episode <laughs> and not watch the episode. Oh, Which is, is what most scene. people do, it feels like. But... You're right about that. Here's the quote. Sorry, I didn't mean to get political. But Daniel <laughs> says, they're, they're showing the scene, or a scene, of, of Emily and Lorelai. Daniel's quote is, and Kelly Bishop playing the most condescending something. I couldn't make it up from the transcript. Condescending on TV. And uh, Amy says, no, I don't see Emily like that. I find her the only voice of reality on the entire show. Here's why I think that's telling. And I think she's kind of kidding, like obviously, because obviously Emily acts inappropriately in a lot of situations and she's in the wrong in a lot of situations. But I think what that demonstrates is that Amy has more affection for this character than Daniel does. And I think that's showcased in this episode because I find Emily to be a person without nuance and a person without empathy or a point of connection for the viewer in this episode because Lorelai says, oh, we don't want to go over, we don't want to do that, my mom's going to be blah, 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 and Luke's like, no, you're overreacting, and oftentimes Lorelai often is, but in this case, she's 100% correct, and we just see that played out, which I think is because of Daniel's less nuanced perspective of that character. I could be in the wrong. This is all conjecture. I'm Kevin Porter. Good night. And this has been Conjecture. I find do, you, do you get that sense, though, that it's a little more 2D in this one, where it's like, you want another beer, Luke? Roadkill, blah, blah, blah. It's not that it's 2D. It's like she went to the bathroom and an alien took over her body. That's it, because there's such a shift in yeah. that first scene. There's a shift when... So she goes from uh, offering him a beer, and it's this very passive, like, I guess we're supposed to see it as aggressive, and then the nitwit juice line happens, and then she comes back, and all of a sudden she's like, heard you're divorced, what's that? And she just changes into a different character entirely, and she stays that way for the rest of the episode, and it just doesn't work for me, because... Emily is, she can be that person, but if she is, she's it with subtlety. She's to the point that like only Lorelai knows, which is why she has to warn people. But then they make Lorelai seem crazy for warning Luke, and she's doing it in a very crazy way, I might add. Uh, and then on top of that, we don't see it until she's like, all right, fine, I'll stop. And then Emily comes back and she's like, Lorelai was right. Would you like a beer? Like, it's just not, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Well, it would have been a much more interesting thing, I think, if he had not, if she hadn't been, if Emily hadn't been so obvious, and if at the end, uh, Luke wasn't like, she did, she did this, you know, uh, every time, like, she made it without, you know, like, insulting me, without really insulting me and all that. Like, if he had no idea, but, sh but, uh, but uh, Lorelai always could, could d decode what Emily was saying, yeah. I think it would have been more fun to watch, because... 
we would have known that Lorelai was right. Do you know what I mean? Right. That if there been... was a more layered approach to it rather yeah. than like yeah, 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 insulting, yeah. calling everything That to rustic me would be where the and, comedy, yeah. would, a more interesting comedy right. would come from. Rather than, also, I do have to say, I find Luke's behavior a little strange when he offers her a sip of his beer. I found that a that, little out of character. That was weird. Right? Uh, yeah. I just, I didn't know what that was supposed to be. Yeah, but it's just think a weird thing that no one would do. Would you like a sip? Yeah, unless you're married or something, because sipping each other's beer is only for marriage, guys. Um, <laughs> I've said That's it before. That's not something you would, you would offer. You wouldn't offer your host a sip of something <laughs> that they were giving to you. Yeah. It's weird. Here's your beer. Thanks. Do you want a beer? Do you want some? <laughs> do you want some? <laughs> but even think about... Think about season three, uh, Swan Song, when Jess comes over with Rory and Emily is perfectly lovely to him and then explodes to Lorelai later. Think about uh, in the hospital in season one when she says to Luke, you're idiots, the both of you, as in you should be together and you're so dumb for not seeing it. Or when she asks Lorelai earnestly, do you have feelings for this man? This doesn't seem to jive with that. This just seems like a hard left that they need to do to make Emily, and to a certain degree, Richard... More manipulative, more hateable, more devious characters, and it doesn't yeah. work for me. They crank it up to 11, and it's not good. I didn't add anything. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, that would be amazing if that was something someone said in every conversation. <laughs> I feel like I do say that a lot, actually. In IRL? Yes, because wow. I, I get in my head and I'm just like, this is, see, this is, I, we don't need to even say this. Um, what's the next thing to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Down to the point. Well, I did want to play a clip, and it's part of our unofficial segment called, is this homophobic? <laughs> and this is Lorelai ranting and raving to Luke about the direness of the impending dinner. <laughs> but I'm warning you, if I call and tell her it's on, and then you change your mind and you want to back out, well, we're gonna have to leave the country and have extensive facial surgery and sex changes, both of us, so that we can, you know, kiss and not look funny. Okay. Is this homophobic? <laughs> I think it's just a weird line that is transphobic and homophobic, but also just bad. Like, I think they didn't think it through to, oh, wait, this means a thing that is offensive. I think they were just like, I, part of me thinks that they thought, oh, well, if one of them gets a sex change, then it's gonna look like Luke is wearing a dress. And he's still a man, but he's wearing, like, it's a Jenna Maroney and Will Forte thing. Uh, and I think they saw that as like, well, we can't have that, it's 2004. Uh, and I think <laughs> it was if they so proper in 2004, I miss yes. those days. <laughs> I think if they thought a little bit more about it, they would have been like, no, we, that's the line we should cut. But it's not intentionally like, ooh, gays. I think it's just super misguided. Like they didn't think about it and they were just like, this is a funny thing to say. It's, it's really tough, and, and they were wrong. It was really tough to, uh, to contextualize it because it's, it's, things have, attitudes have changed so much, even in that brief amount of time, from right. 2004 to today, that that line, if you'd, if you'd seen it then, I don't think it would have even registered that much. It would have just seemed like a, a throwaway kind of thing. But now it is kind of glaring, and it's like, that's not, it's not only kind of homophobic, but it's just bad comedy. Like, it's not that good. It's it a didn't real feel first well draft. Through. It's a real first drafty kind of thing. Also, there was another line later on that has nothing to do with homophobia, but she just throws in, I see dead people out of nowhere. Like, yeah. when she's, she's like going into something about how it's going to be She's possessed. The phone's heavy. Yeah, the yeah, blah, yeah. Blah, blah, yeah. Blah, blah, I see yeah. De uh, come on. You can't just throw in an I see dead people. I don't, that has nothing to do with anything. It I would say that's a Daniel touch, though. Well, you know get Daniel in here. I want to talk to him. <laughs> Please, well, we welcome. Him. Daniel Paladino. Sorry we made you stand backstage while trashing your episode. <laughs> now, what, what, makes that, what makes that a Daniel touch? Daniel touches are... <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that's the next t-shirt. If Daniel touches happen to you, go to a policeman or go to your teacher. <laughs> I feel like Daniel Touches is like a, a clown's name. Like, oh, I'm Daniel Touches. I'm Daniel Touches. <laughs> Some hallmarks of Daniel Palladino's writing style. 
would be an indulgence in quirk, an indulgence of pop culture references. Daniel was uh, a writer on Family Guy for a time and actually did end up going back to Family Guy for a few seasons after his time on Gilmore Girls as a producer. So I see some of that. Like, I could imagine, like, Peter Griffin saying, ah, we got to get sex changes so we won't look funny or whatever. Like, I could, I could imagine that. I can imagine it now that you did that impression. <laughs> Thank you. It's much easier. It's my job to transport people to another place. But you know what I mean? Like, it's just like a... a, a it, it doesn't track. It's just like a reference that's stuck in there, but it has nothing to do with anything that's going on. It doesn't come out organically out of any dialogue, and it's just like... It's just shoehorned in there, and I don't know. It's, it's that kind of... It's, it's, it's a placeholder joke as opposed to the, the ultimate joke that you're the supposed actual, to yeah. write. She also does a thing that she does very often which is to uh, start telling a joke by making you guess what she wants you to say. She goes, how dark is it? And then Luke has to, if he decides, he's like, like I don't want to play Carson. this game. Huh? <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, he's like, if he were like, oh, I don't want to play this game, how are you? The joke is done. But she, he has to go, how dark is what? He has to be confused for her to go, right. the cloud over. It's like a weird, <laughs> I hate that type like, of joke. And he falls for it every single yes, time. Yes, exactly. Damn it, Lorelai. It's like he's up-dogging her every... Or it's like she's up-dogging him every up-dogging time. Her. Yeah. Hey, Luke, it smells like up-dogging here. What's up, That's terrible. Like, if she just said, that's terrible, she's like, well, damn, another joke ruined. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I really want to talk about what she's wearing in that scene, and you know what that means. You know what's scary is for a second there, I didn't know what you meant. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll start with that scene. This is Lorelai in the diner. We'll bring the lights down a little bit. And is the oh. scarf, Whoa. it's almost a bolo tie, but it's not, and it's green. It looks like a scarf that Steven Tyler ties on a microphone. <laughs> totally. Oh, I see that. Or She's like, been hanging out with Teresa Reback a little too much. Deep cut for Smash fans. <laughs> and we can talk about, well, I'll put this up for Deep you, Paul. Deep cut for Smash fans. <laughs> this is Mr. Danny Strong in the, uh, with his cool floppy hair. Hey, he's got cool floppy hair. And his Neil deGrasse Tyson tie. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This is him in the newsroom saying, we had a very all the president's men moment. Which I see like that, Paul, would probably be more of a reference that is more organic, more comes out of the story, because yes. Doyle is trapped in like his all the president's men moment constantly. Like he is he is a Sorkin character stuck in a Paladino show. By the way, do you feel <laughs> like they the correct thing would have been to say that was a very West Wing moment? Like do you think they were like well, I think that's can't. too close to home. I think that's what I was saying. Like, yeah. do you think that they were like the right things to say West Wing, but we can't draw the comparison? Well, because people legitimately in interviews said to Amy Sherman Paladino, there's been rumors that Amy Sherman Palladino is a pseudonym for Aaron Sorkin. What? For writing Gilmore Girl. Like, I read quotes when she's like, no, it's not a pseudonym. So I'm sure she's tired yeah, of Yeah, I'm it. Amy Sherman Palladino, and uh, I know that I'm a person, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm me. I He's exist. Me. <laughs> also, Aaron Sorkin hates women. So how is... I mean, guys, watch the newsroom. He's it not a fan. It might be true. He's not a fan. Watch Social Network for all the strong, powerful... Man. Woman. <laughs> Strong, powerful woman. Uh, we can talk about Lane's kind of... This is Lane's like uniform for the diner, I think. I just noticed her shoes. Like her cardigan. Her shoes are red. Uh, like Zach crux. is dressed up like a middle schooler. <laughs> Here's what I like about this scene. What, what were you going to say? What, what does he do during the day? Uh, he thinks about getting ready finally to which he, I still don't know what that means like does that mean he like finally broke it off with that girl in Hartford or something he's like I'm ready now that's what happens in this episode did he take care of something for that to occur or was it just like oh I had to process I'm I think a it's processor. like what Jess did he's like oh if we're gonna date I gotta dump someone I have a, I have a, I have a fashion question sure uh, over there is that uh, a person in one of those to catch a predator suits <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. That's for the visual <laughs> companion. I, we'll I, I do like Lane's uh, diner outfit, though. It's always the same thing, but it's always very cute. It seems like, like again, if she was a cartoon, like that would be the perfect... I love that we get to see her in it every time. It's adorable. 
It's adorable. This is Lorelai and Rory in the first scene. I gotta say, Rory's hair in this episode is season best. It's fantastic. <laughs> it looks wonderful. She looks like Beautiful, she's off to a gentleman the yelled out from the crowd. Yeah. By it the really way, is good. I, I usually do this at the beginning of the show. Clap if you're a single man here tonight. Oh. All right. Everyone take note. Moving on. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> This is, I, I wanted to point it out. I mean, she looks gorgeous as usual, but the lighting in this scene, this is Emily talking to Luke and Lorelai on their like dinner date. The lighting is haunting. Like she's underlit, like a horror movie kind of from the fireplace. Well, she's about to tell a spooky story about the boyfriend she didn't get to meet. <laughs> Lorelai. This is when Rory and Logan show up to the campsite. Logan's rocking a leather jacket and a sweater. I would wear that sweater. I like that sweater. It looks warm. Why is he wearing a jacket and a sweater? Well, they're out in the secret woods. It was That's probably cold. <laughs> I want to point out Lorelai and her classic. This is just her uniform now. It's like a button-up shirt and a vest. This has made an appearance so many times. Yes. And I love it. I it's love nice. It. Very simple. Uh, I just wanted to show Logan's little face here in this scene. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like the dead tutor in Happy Gilmore. Happy Gilmore Girls. These are uh, two of the rich uh, D-bags. Oh, sure. <laughs> what is that? Oh, I was explaining. Never mind. Fuck oh, these guys. I hate these guys. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that guy's face. Ugh. It's, these two aren't my favorite. I like Finn the best, I think. That's Colin, right? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, was, uh, I had a 50-50 shot. And Who then, transports all their brandy snifters and shit out to the forest? <laughs> That's what I was wondering. Who set this up? <laughs> this is a lot of work. The budget was big. The budget was big, guys. Which I thought maybe an interesting reveal could be like, oh, well, Richard was part of the Life and Death Brigade. That's why we let you in, Rory, because you're part of that lineage. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that would have been an interesting kind of organic story point. Sure. That did not occur. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> sure didn't. <laughs> oh, Danny pals. This is uh, <laughs> Logan and Rory. I got your uh, event integrity right here, mister. What? I love that line. I hate that no, line. No, I love it. I think it's great. It, it, <laughs> it goes against everything she's been setting up. It's just like, I don't really like you. I'm just here for fun. And then she goes like, well, mister, I got your event integrity right. It's so weird. She delivers it so weird. No, I yes. think it's totally consistent. I don't think you so. You come back, Paul. I think it's she's, okay. These, the chair scooting on this is the most... This is the most visual show we've ever if done. If you want like a, a visual representation of our relationships, just watch the chair placement <laughs> at any given moment. It, I just I had to take note of when she said that because I was like, first of all, you're still pretending you don't like this guy. Two, uh, I don't know what that means. Like I know that you're saying like, <laughs> well, I did dress up in the thing now, but it, it really just sounds like uh, we doing this kind of thing. <laughs> We doing this? It sounds like she's coming out with an innuendo to go like, I got your fucking your integrity right here, man. Oh boy, because that's, that's that's all that ever is. Exactly. The, I have your blank right here. Exactly. It's either that's all that ever is. It's said before two people. It's have not literally like, oh, it's right over here. Yes. It it it's always a reference to junk. That's always what it is. It's only said before two people have sex or before a man in like a tank Wait, top assaults someone on the street. It's always said before two people yeah. have sex. Yeah. Kevin, do you say this a lot? What's the... the I'll take your word for it. Uh, this is Lorelai in the inn wearing a dragonfly shirt. It's the dragonfly inn. Great shout out. Good work, Brenda. It's too scary. Too scary. Too spooky? Well, too spooky. It makes me think, what if a dragonfly was that big? <laughs> <laughs> or what if that's an actual dragonfly Lorelai captured? That's not helping, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. My... my thought about this shirt is so the previous uh night we see her in just a like a sweater and a button-up shirt and it's casual formal and enough that it would make sense for her to be running an inn while she's wearing that this just kind of seems like she's a friend of someone at the inn like uh, not like she can do whatever she wants it's her sure. inn but it's so weird to me that she like decides like i'm just gonna throw on this shirt like a glittery it looks like it's from limited two or something <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 justice for those of you Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> but I just, it, 
feels so weird. Like, I don't, like, there's no consistency to what she decides to wear to work. And that's what you're looking for in a woman, consistency. <laughs> Yeah, what's, whatever the opposite of in omnia paratus is. <laughs> what would, what would Ready the for opposite? no changes. <laughs> Ready for nothing. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Ah, uh, man. Well, I think that's been the fashion report. Fashion. Oh, my God. You know, I scared Paul. I'm sorry, Paul. I thought he might have joined in. I wasn't sure if you wanted me to join in. Or if you were going to scream, uh, b- commit a vampire attack on me. <laughs> we always hold our breath before we end that segment until you join in. <laughs> I, for- I totally forgot. The two things we forgot are from. Uh, yeah, that was weird. Oh, boy. Hello, world. The lights just came on like a chopper is coming to get us. <laughs> um, so the the two things we forgot are the outfits that Lane and Zach wear on their date. Oh, I got um, those. I just skipped over them. We can oh, okay. look at them real quick. Oh, uh, that's not them. Do you have to do the song again? What's that? Do you have to do the song again? Oh, <laughs> no, we, we, we won't do it. The song can't hurt you anymore, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> this is Lane and Zach on their date. Yeah. Zach looks like he walked off the set of Almost Famous. And he, he looks just exactly home. like Hutch of Starsky and Hutch fame. Mm-hmm. I feel that. And the, Lane, the movie, not the TV show, right? Right. Owen Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't, I couldn't tell what Lane's sweater was at first. I thought it was like a weird, like it kind of feels like the, and I know it's not the style, but like all I could think of was Yo Gabba Gabba, like that dude's hat. <laughs> and then I realized it's a face with sunglasses, and now I'm thinking it looks like the Nightcrawler poster on her sweater. So the Nightcrawler poster. Yeah. Those were important enough that I had to come back to this image to say it. Is and, it Janice from The Muppets? <laughs> I see the lips. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Janice from the Muppets, guys. She also, does you. Google it. The, f- the fact that their date was sitting on that futon deeply depressed. Yeah, me. let's talk about that. Let's talk about because essentially the date was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to it by now. The date. Wa- <laughs> I welcome the sun. The, it was Netflix and chill, though, right? Yes. Yeah, that's why it was Netflix it was and chill. It was proto-Netflix and chill. Yeah. Stop making sense and chill. Not that their taste isn't good. Yeah. We love the Talking Heads, right? Uh, the name of the band is Talking Heads. Oh, it's not the Talking Heads. No. I was doing that Letterman thing. He, was o- he would always add the before saying someone's like, the Oprah, the, the adultery the I committed. Uma. Anyway. The Gilmore Girls. <laughs> the Gilmore Girls. Um, uh, who is the weirdo that comes in and disturbs Brian? <laughs> That's their bandmate, Brian. Which he brings up. See, Brian is kind of the voice of reason in this. Isn't this what we did last night? Isn't this exactly, but you were just not wearing pants? Uh, he is kind of a beacon of, he's the canary in the coal mine saying, this is not a good date. But then I guess it is, <laughs> this is, I guess it ends up being charming because they do have a little smooch at the end. I think it's a perfect date for them. Honestly, this storyline in this uh, scene was it's my bummer. favorite in the episode. Really? I loved it so much. From his, am I early, weird thing, which wasn't really a joke from his point of view, but just a stupid thing he says because he's nervous, is so great. And it's literally like, what do you do if you are not only like really good friends, but you live together? Like, where do you meet up? Where do you go? Like, I think the idea of them sitting on the couch is so perfect to just them. Like, that's not a good first date idea. But if, if for people who are very good friends and are weird and nervous and who are like their lives are just music and they love talking heads, I think it's hilarious and very sweet that they were both just like, we can just, you know, do what we did yesterday when we were friends. You know, the same thing we are now, except we kiss sometimes. That's a, that is a very sweet idea. Yeah. But <laughs> is there nothing else to do? That's, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> like I just think it's a fun is thing. Is there other music in Stars Hollow? Are there, have the troubadours left by this point? No, they're still kicking. They come back in a big way next season. Right. But they're, they're around. Okay. They're around, for All sure. Right. No, they could have gone to the, to the little uh, movie place and watched Pippi Longstocking. They, they could have gone to Pippi the arcade. <laughs> Oh, there's a movie called we are a movie. There's an episode called We Got Us a Pippi Virgin. It's all about them going to see a Pippi Longstocky movie. I I <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to say that with so much gravitas. I'm sorry. I think that I wasn't on board with it. So I watched this two times, and I wasn't on board with it the first time until Lane gets to the point where she's on Zach's side about like Brian, get out of here. We're on a date. Like her face just says it all. Because before that, she's kind of like. 
okay, I guess we can stay here. And then when they start like watching the movie, it's funny to have her go like, oh, Brian, because they're on the same page, even though they're both wrong. And I think that's <laughs> why I was just like, they're perfect. It's kind of typical of the story, though. Yes. It's, it's a date that is lazy and doesn't take much effort. It's a lazy date, but they're both like slacker band, like slacker rockers, and it's kind of perfect for them. They're watching something they mm-hmm. love. They're bonding over it. It is literally what they did yesterday, <laughs> but it's... It's really sweet because they're both on the same page about it simultaneously being weird, but also them being like, it's a date. What do you, please leave. Like, uh, there's something really cute about that. And also, I think that Brian is also the voice of reason, but he's also the Kirk of their entire life. (laughs) Their own personal Kirk. He's college Kirk, yes. Okay. And I love him. (laughs) John Cabrera, wherever you are, we love you. One thing I felt was interesting in listening to the commentary is that they all... The sole commentary for the The sole commentary, the one true commentary for Gilmore Girls, mm-hmm. is that they did admit, oh, yeah, Adam Brody left, so we just bumped the next guy up. <laughs> they put it That's that, great. That, it wasn't like, and we thought Lane and Zach had a chemist. They were like, oh, we just bumped the next guy up. I wasn't on board with the Lane-Zach uh, thing because it was very clear that was what they were trying to do, and they were right. like, well, we got to heighten it, so maybe it's a person that's been here all along. But I think this episode made me like I'm solidly in the camp of like they're great together. So I'm excited wow. to see them. So you're you're in. You're all in on Zach. Yeah, and I'm all in on. Uh, oh, that's good. On Zane. On Zane. Oh dang. Lack. Zane Lack. Sure. I did want to read the quote from Amy regarding the men on the show in the commentary. She says, it's just an assembly line of hot boys we have in a warehouse, and we just bring them out for the. WB stable. <laughs> they hot just bump boys. up the next one. Yeah. It's quite an image. Oh, man. Anything we need to discuss? Oh, I want to discuss uh, Richard taking Luke to the driving range of betrayal uh, <laughs> that he often goes to for uh, devious things. The dick joke that we talked about. The great dick joke. I'll bring up dick on the internet and see what comes up. <laughs> that great. was a joke. That was actually a pretty good I, joke. I, I thought it worked. That was a pretty good I joke. I think it was great. And that's one of the best. You know, when they show like all the highlight reels of like Edward Herman. <laughs> Here I am. It's always the dick joke on the show, which I find to be interesting. Also, joke. fun fact, when Luke was calling Lorelai, he's like, I'm drunk, I'm on the driving range, I gotta read the Odyssey. He was for real sick that day and vomiting all day. No and they way. they had to shoot that scene anyway. Do you think they changed it because of that? No, I think it makes sense. Also, although we should talk about the fact that Lorelai's like, well, just hit a few more balls and drive home in the current state you're in. Did she? That's not a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> it, did, it implicitly encouraged drunk driving. Although, yes. was it a drive? Yeah. No, never mind. I was going to say drive is in a golf term, but no. <laughs> <laughs> this was, is a top ten moment for me right now. <laughs> I want to play uh, the clip of Emily and Richard at the end, and then I want to take a few questions. Why would you go golfing with that man? Why on earth? Who, Luke? You are encouraging this ridiculous relationship. Emily, please. He is not good enough for Lorelai or to be Rory's stepfather, God forbid. Can we be a little more of a snob, Emily? The fact that you paraded him around the club, our club. It happened to be a fruitful outing. I am going to assist him in franchising his diner. Richard, that hirsute lout is not capable of running a complex business. Well, that's obvious, Emily. That's why he will have no significant role. He'll be the front man. We'll shave him, stick his picture on the menus. The whole thing will hopefully bestow some credibility on him. At least then, if this insane relationship between him and Lorelai continues, we can legitimately take him to places like the club. At least on holidays. This is absurd. You're absurd. The whole thing's absurd. And you're not thinking ahead. Excuse me. (laughs) Richard is an insane criminal mastermind. He, that is the takeaway, right? Mm -hmm. Which I found to be kind of in character from what we saw last season yeah. with the betrayal of Digger and getting back with his old partner and joining the firm again. This is like, this is who Richard is. He's not sweet grandpa reading the newspaper who's obsessed with how tall everyone is, although he is obsessed yes. with it if, in this episode. If you are a daughter of his and you, if you are dating a daughter of his, he wants to know how tall you are. <laughs> I don't remember you being this tall, yeah. Luke. I feel if I went to a diner and I saw... That guy's face with that dumb hat looking at me. <laughs> I'd walk right out of that diner. That I I must say that the decision that they made to have that character wear that backwards baseball hat 
I'll never understand it. I understand it. What underst do you understand about it? I feel like it was a move of convenience in terms of every time we see him without the hat, there's something different going on. Yeah, it's and I think it was to achieve consistency in that department. Yeah, truthfully, that could be right. But how about just turn the fucking hat around? <laughs> Wear it like a true man. Just sure. wear it like a hat. It, it drove me crazy. <laughs> well, it doesn't get any better. This, this is supposed to be your hot dude, uh, will they, won't they person for your female lead, your hero. It's true. Turn your hat around. <laughs> and let the sun beat on his neck? Never. <laughs> <laughs> then go deer stalker, my friend. Well... That could have been a good way to explain That would have been very... If he was the guy who owned the diner who wore a Sherlock Holmes hat. <laughs> that would have been it's an interesting character choice. <laughs> oh, man. Well, we've been doing a little segment in the last couple of episodes. I want to continue, and this is something we call Twop on Pop, which is where... Still need a we, better name. Which no one knows what this is because we started in an episode that hasn't come out yet. But it's, uh, it's what? When, yeah, no, it's in 505 that we started oh. this. Oh, I was like... Hmm, this no, is when we, we read comments from Television Without Pity and see how people reacted to this in real time as when this came out without, uh, you know, hindsight or the history or looking forward. So this is just people's fresh, raw, hot takes. Hot takes. Hot takes. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Sweet Tooth says, Pet peeve. Can they please stop naming the shows after direct quotes from the script? I've said it before, but it just bugs me to no end. Be creative, people. That's a hot take. <laughs> they write 70 pages of a script, and you're just like, hmm, one more line would have done. Like, it doesn't <laughs> matter. Ozzy. Not only do you never know what it is, like, if you're just, if you're, a, you could be a person who watches every episode of the show, show and still not know what any of the titles are. It's fine. Ozzy512 writes in, I would like to register my disgust with the secret society and the most foppish, supercilious bunch of young people this side of Jeeves and Wooster novel. <laughs> No wonder Roy My likes. Word. <laughs> no wonder Roy likes P.G. Wodehouse. If this guy's the new boyfriend, then there's gonna be a hole in my Tuesday night TV schedule. Oh, a direct oh, threat! Shit. Oh man, that's when it all went there downhill was a, for Gilmore. Because Mills. this episode is remembered very well and very, I think, because of the iconography and the imagery of it. But at the time, oh, I have a new email. At the time, <laughs> it was regarded with mixed reception. And I think that's an interesting to remember just because I think we think of, oh, them at the top of the thing with the umbrellas and the taxes, but, but there are some problems in this episode. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I mean, like, I, 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 a lot of people reached out to say that this is their favorite episode, and that's wonderful, and I get it, but at the same time, part of me is like, I've already seen, I think, three episodes better than this, which in is, this season. In this, no, right. not in this season. Mm, maybe in the season. I, I have the word. I cannot tell you what I rated five oh six, and we did it two days ago. <laughs> Yesterday, God. Oh, <laughs> I'm oh, no. losing my memory in real time. I'm sorry. And you all get to watch it like a relative. Live streaming of dementia. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, too. Okay. <laughs> Too anyway. soon to reference relatives. <laughs> it's just so weird to me. Like, I mean, again, I get it. It's because they go out of the like norm. It's a very iconic episode. They do so many things they won't do again and haven't done before, and people love that. But at the same time, I feel like putting it to a grinder, you go, act, there are a lot of problems with it. So, sure. Yeah. I want to read one question from Twitter for a Twitter Q&A. Twitter Q&A. Isaac asks, what would your motto be if you had to choose one for a secret society? You kind of chose yours. It's the opposite of an omnia for us. Right. Out omnia parad. You. My, mine would be, uh, I think mine might be <laughs> describing a Bible character who has trouble sleeping. Insomnia what? Barabbas. Oh. <laughs> Don't clap for him. <laughs> clap for him. Give it up. Give it up. That was a good one. No, please don't. <laughs> they're no, just no, like, no. They're like, we were with you the first time. Oh, boy. Paul? Oh. Uh, 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 ornamentum 
Hokum, go Pokum. I think that's a Harry Potter spell. It's part of it. It's to decorate a tree. Well, we want to take a. F- <laughs> we want to take a few quick questions from the audience for a little audience Q and A. So if anyone has any cues they'd like us to A, speak now. Thank you, Paul. We got a cue in the back. We got a cue in the back? Where do I see? Where do I see? Here we go. Can I reach up this far? Yes, I can. Oh. Hi, Kevin. Hello. What's your name? Yana from LA. (laughs) Kevin, if Demi were to jump, would you jump? I would, so he wouldn't get all the attention. (laughs) That's fair. No, I, I would totally jump. We got okay, one in the front here. row. What is your name and what is your question? Uh, my name is Caitlin. So what would your stunt be that would be exciting and death-defying? If we had a secret society, what would our big stunt at the end of the event be? Well, I think the idea of them having a stunt at all is just kind of like, it's weird. I don't know. I don't think it's necessary. Again, it's, this is a fraternity. Um, but I think that I guess if they got to do something interesting, just make it something that isn't, we're going to lower you slowly to earth. <laughs> like, even if it's like you're free falling for a while and then you hit a bungee snap and then you, like, or a zip, something that, like, either actually has the risk of, no, I don't want the risk of death. Something that just maybe. Be honest. <laughs> something, I, I, something about, I think it's just the idea of any stunt here is not necessary, and anything they could have done would have been like, no, of course everyone's going to make it out safe, so to, to build this up as in like, I can't do it, I can't do it, is so weird, I mean, it's real. But Here's what I weird. think it is, truthfully, is I think the stunt exists not really for the purpose of the society, but for the purpose of this storyline. This right. is the thing, Logan is pushing Rory out of her comfort zone, out of her boundaries and something more interesting and something more dangerous, something bad for you, blah, blah, blah. So this needed to occur for that arc to continue. Right. So that was like a big kind of turning point, I feel like. I still feel like, what a weird turning point. Like, the whole motto is just like, sometimes you gotta get peer pressured. And he peer pressures her by going, hey, it's your choice. But if you don't do this, you're a terrible journalist. You know who did this? George Plimpton. Uh, the, you and the, the dude, and Brian Williams did. Like, it's just so weird that he would... Uh, Brian peer- Williams wouldn't be the greatest example at this point. I couldn't think of a single oh. reporter. Um, My yeah. stunt would be I'd burn that forest to the ground. <laughs> That's right. And I'd salt the earth that nothing more would grow there. Paul, are you okay? Huh? Where'd you go, buddy? I'm real good. Are we doing questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, a few more questions. Anyone? Anyone where I can reach with there. the microphone? Oh, I got one right here on the aisle. Hello. Your name and your question. Um, my name is Gwen, and I wanted to know why you did not talk about Lorelai's heart sweater. Yeah, why didn't we oh, talk yeah, about... Oh, yeah, we mentioned it briefly, but we didn't really get it. We got like... derailed by uh, uh, Rory's hair. <laughs> oh, that's, that's true. true. That that's is what exactly happened. what happened. Rory's heart, I mean, is, the, is that supposed to be like a character thing? Like Lorelai wears her heart on her sleeve, literally. Is that what that's she supposed doesn't. to communicate? I, no, I think she does in terms of like what she wants and needs at any given moment. Maybe. All right. I, okay. I, but, but no one was trying to say that with that sweater, right? That was just a sweater they had. I hope not. I think it was just a weird sweater. It looks like the like, neon lights on like a Vegas chapel. Just like it's a circle I like this of interpretation. I'm literally just imagining like what if they started lighting up in sequence. That's what I imagined when I saw this. Season eight, it's gonna happen. Do we Great. have a question up here? Can't your wait. name and your question. My name is Ashton, and I'm wondering what are you two gonna do for your one year anniversary? That is such a sweet There's question. a lot of cute questions happening tonight. <laughs> for our one year anniversary? Yeah. Well, maybe we could go back to the place where we first recorded our first podcast. The place we record it now? Right. Yes. And I could have a picture of us framed <laughs> from that first podcast recording session. That would be adorable. Yeah. And, and like, would read really well on the, uh, the audio-only show that we do. Rose petals around the microphones, perhaps. Um, a little music playing. And then maybe, for the first time, we could watch an episode of Gilmore Girls with just each other. And not for the podcast, but just for fun and the joy of watching the show. I don't know about that. Does that sound fun? No. Oh, boy. Well. What would I do for your anniversary? Yeah. (laughs) Paul, what would you do for our anniversary? What would you? Well. (laughs) 
I'd probably rent a stretch Hummer limo. <laughs> we go on what I call a Gilmore Girls booze cruise. Ooh. Ooh. Where we drive to, I think it was the Paramount lot. <laughs> WB. 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 Of course, WB. Uh, we probably hit Paramount before the WB, though. Right. <laughs> Quick little stopover. See all the greats. <laughs> yeah. And we'd just crash that some bitch through the gates. Drive all around Stars Hollow, <laughs> doing as many donuts as a stretch donuts. limo can do. Yeah. Have another donut, Pavarotti. Right? That yes. fat fuck. I'm glad he's dead. He had no right to live. <laughs> oh. So says that character on the Gilmore Girls. <laughs> Gilmore Girls, Gilmore Girls. One um, more question. And then uh, oh, champagne oh, toast. <laughs> okay, oh, you're still it. going. <laughs> no, no, I'm done. <laughs> no, you had another Sh thing. Champagne toast. Champagne toast. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Fun. I do champagne. One toast. more question. We got one over here on the edge. Your name and your question. Hi, my name is Heather, and it actually is my birthday as of like three minutes ago. Woo! So it stars Holla. Happy birthday to Heather. Happy birthday. So it's not so much a question as a I'm request. sorry, did Heather say oh, her birthday was three months ago? <laughs> three minutes ago. Three minutes ago. <laughs> what? Wait, what time is it? Oh. oh! How did you feel about Zach when uh, they banished Brian from the date? And he's like, well, what if we need that room later? Oh, I thought, uh, part of me was like, that's very true to Zach, and I love that Lane was like, uh, go in my room. Uh, I thought it was a... I was proud of, uh, I was proud of Lane, personally. I, I just thought it was a very funny joke for them to play. I think it, it acknowledges the dichotomy of Zach is trying to date this woman, but he's also, like, he's the kind of guy who's like, you know, things are going to go well, and then Lane just shuts it down, and I think it's a good way to acknowledge the fact that before they were together, he was just kind of like, I'm going to kiss every girl I can. And now that he's still in that mindset, she's like, okay, dude. Like, I, I just think it was a perfect way to acknowledge that uh, part of him that he what he hasn't always just been this weird, like, nervous, sweet guy. He was kind of like a play, or trying to be, a playboy. And I, I don't know. I like the way that they acknowledge that with a, just a fun little joke that really just kind of gets it out of the way. Amen. And on that, I think we should write the episode. Shall we? <laughs> no, there's no vampire tag. Oh, okay. <laughs> I enjoyed the episode. I think the thing that bugs me, because I enjoyed the Life and Death Brigade stuff, then I think you did, and probably you did. Although, I got to, we, please give that Paul Tom commitment for dressing up as a <laughs> from this show in attire, Life and Death Brigade attire. So I will give it, I'm going to give it 8 out of 10 E's. 8 out of 10 E's. Because I'm going to use all the E's I want. Well, that's 8 more than you should have. Yeah. No, that's not me saying this is a zero episode because I think it's very good. Um, I think, I get why this is people's favorite. It's a fun episode to watch. I think it's a, like, for people, if this was the first episode of Gilmore Girls I ever watched, I'd probably be like, this show seems fun. I'd probably come back to watch this. But at the same time, there are so many things that just don't resonate with me and just don't work. And you guys are going to hate me for this. This is the first time I think I realized that I don't think I like Lorelai very much. I think she is kind of annoying sometimes. I think we've established that. No, but it's like, it's, it, they crank it up in this episode between the thing of her saying that, like, all, like warning Luke of the stuff for Emily and warning, uh, or, and the whole, the weird joke that she does and the Kent Kalita thing on the phone. And I, I realized that because I was like, what was the Lorelai storyline? I was like, there wasn't really one. And I kind of went, I think that's fine. And again, people, are, I'm sure I will like her again the next episode. But well, I think I just, it's a function of the arc of the series, maybe, too. Maybe. I, I think so, because in, especially in this season, as we see Rory and Rory more wooed by this world of entitlement and privilege, I think we see Lorelai starting to lose some of those, like, because the archetype of Lorelai made in the first couple of seasons, like, grassroots by her own bootstraps. Right. She raised herself, she raised her daughter, and now that they've separated, they used what could have been a weakness of... You know, just like, oh, she has to go to college, but they use that as a strength. And how do Lorelai and Rory function without each other when you break up that codependency a little bit? So I think maybe you disliking Lorelai a little bit more is a function of the story they're trying to tell. I hope so. Um, but it also, <laughs> I, I think it, I was, uh, now I've lost my train of thought. I feel, I feel like it was, it, 
doesn't help that the previous ep- I think that Lorelai's strength is when she is not trying to be funny or like trying to be bitty. I think it's when she's having these real moments like the previous episode with Christopher. Sure. And uh, the moments where like the, the season four finale is one of the strongest, it's the highest rated episode on IMDb for a reason because it's the best Lorelai episode, it's the best Rory episode, it's some of the best story the show's ever had because it's a lot of Lorelai being serious and uh, I think that because this episode has none of that and it's just pure bit and pure like putting her to a secondary point where she can't really do anything to help any of the characters made me just go like oh I don't even need that part you can cut her from this episode entirely which is an uncomfortable way to feel about the main character of a show but uh, anyway I give this (laughs) seven and a half um, seven and a half unexplainable Max Ernst quotes I I'm Out of so, how many unexplainable Max Ten unexplainable Max <laughs> right, quotes. I would love for someone listening no, to this No, don't do it. He's Twitter. never going to learn. Don't, don't say it on Twitter. You don't, don't know what it Facebook. is either. I don't, but I, that's kind of the beauty of it. Please, someone tell me. In a way, the unknown. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Tompkins. This is tough for me because... Turn those lights, turn those lights down. We don't see <laughs> people anymore. No offense, people, but it's, it's unnerving. I feel judged. <laughs> that's better. Um... Obviously, having not watched the series in quite a long time and not being caught up on the storylines at all, uh, it's very tough for me to judge. And yet also, extremely easy for me to judge. (laughs) I'm going to go right down the middle and give it a five because I think that there were, um, there were, if I were seeing the show for the very first time, I think, as you said, it would be intriguing enough to me to continue watching it But it was hard to like people. You know what I mean? It was hard to like the characters in this. Lorelai, I think, especially, there was nothing pleasant about her in this. She wasn't given anything pleasant to do or say. It was just like, it's very tough to watch somebody just be consistently negative and the only time it turns around is at the end when you know Luke agrees like, yeah, she's horrible. It's like, hooray. We're (laughs) we're together on that, a victory. and yeah, the, I did find it hard with the, uh, with the, with the, the, what the, what live and die brigade? What were they called? Life, Life and, and death. death. Life and crossbones. That's and also death. like a terrible. They, they could have come up with a better name. So that was a, a first draft name. First draft name. They're like, what do? Well, it's something more. I, I, they, why were they the Life and Death Brigade? Do you the, know what I mean? The Pomp and Circumstance Brigade. What would be better? Charlie's Angels. Just Charlie's Angels. Just straight, straight up, up Charlie's yeah. Angels. Charlie's Angels. <laughs> yeah, they should have been called Charlie's Angels. Uh, and, and then Otter's Jug Band Christmas, I think, would have been a fine name <laughs> for those people. <laughs> we are a secret society called Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas. Uh, five out of ten what? Um, heart sweaters. Woo! Oh, guys, now it's time real quick for a segment we call Where You Tweet. I will follow... Where we plug our social media because that's what it's all about and the stuff we're working on. Paul? Yes. What do you want to plug? Uh, You can find me on all the usual places at PF Tompkins on Twitter and uh, my uh, Tumblr that has information about me. Um, And uh, my podcast is called Spontanea Nation. That is on Earwolf. You don't have to. Come on, guys. Don't shit. (laughs) I'm just talking to the audience at home. I'm not talking to you guys. I know you guys checked out on me a while ago. You're like, this guy's he, he dressed up in a costume, but he's bumming us out. He's being mean about the show. <laughs> Only Demi is allowed to be mean about the show because he's on a journey. Right. I, I know I'm not on a journey. And you're just like, fuck this guy. He's no Jason Manzukis. We had so much fun with Jason. This guy's just a drag. Oh, that's anyway, not true. So, that's me. Check uh, out Spontaneum Nation. No, you shut up is coming back to TV. I cannot comment on that. Uh, okay. I got in trouble for doing so earlier. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, regardless, check out the older episodes. They're those great. Just, you can watch. I can talk about those all I want. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, man, you can find me at Kevin T. Porter everywhere. Uh, you can find me at Electrolemon everywhere. And What's that? What's his username? Electro Lemon. Yeah! That's my new ringtone. Guys, give it up for Mr. Paul F. Tompkins! And there's only one thing left to do. I think we 
We need to do this. It's a part of our journey. It's a part of us becoming more adventurous men, better men. We are going to jump off this stage. For the listener at home, this stage is a 50-foot drop, and we are about to jump off of it. Do not try this at home. Are you ready for this? I sure am. You jump, I jump, Paul. Here we go. <gasps> Woo! <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you for coming out to the show tonight. On the road, feeling lonely. And That's so cold. Da, da, da. All, All you have, have to do is call my name and I'll be there, there on the next train. train. Where you leave, so Paul. Paul, I will follow any, anywhere that you tell me to. If you need, you need me to be with you. I will follow. I will follow. Paul Any knows all the words, words in his you memory too. Where you lead, you lead me to be with you. I, I will follow you. where you lead. There's four words in the song. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming to the show tonight. We'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>